This is part one of me driving an electric car from John O'Groats to Land's End. If you're a little bit confused about why I might want to do that, you probably haven't seen the last video yet. There's a link in the description. And I recommend you check that out before watching this so that you understand what's going on. As we arrived in John O'Groats, the weather was absolutely crazy. It was proper gale force winds uh, to the point where I got out of the car at a Duncan's Behead Lighthouse, which is uh, just a couple of miles from John O'Groats and is actually the most northeastern tip of Scotland. And uh, my glasses actually got blown off my face. That's how bad the wind was. So um, the weather certainly wasn't great. And I thought this journey right from this the start I thought was going to then be a test of how well EVs perform in really bad weather conditions. Because not only was it windy and rainy, it was set to be pretty cold as well. Since we're running pretty low on charge, having driven all the way up to John O'Groats, it was time to recharge. Uh, there was no point in taking care of this the next morning, and unfortunately there weren't any charging facilities available at the hotel, so I had to use these Osprey Rapid Chargers, which have just been installed. Three units, delivering 75 kilowatts. I did notice that one of the three seemed to be out of service, which was a bit odd from, for a brand new site, but hopefully Osprey are going to be keeping on top of maintenance here. But we soon got charged up. Got charged. I, I, I waited a little bit longer than I normally would at a rapid. We charged at 95%, because normally for a long journey like this, you would aim to, to start at 100%, so I charged at 95%, and that meant by the next day we'd be ready to go. There'd be no problem at all in the morning having to worry about charging, and it would be just simply just leaving straight from John O'Groats with nothing to worry about. The car that I'm using for this challenge is this long-range single-motor Polestar 2 that I've rented from Hertz. It was an absolute bargain. I think it was only about 20 quid a day to rent this car, and actually I've seen them even cheaper than that. I've seen them go down as low as like £17 a day. It has a mileage limit of 300 miles per day, uh, which wouldn't actually be enough to do this challenge if I didn't have it for a couple of days longer than I was actually going to be using it for. But uh, the 19 pence a mile overage fee meant that it was actually was cheaper to rent it for another day or two than it would be to, to pay that fee. And this seems like an absolute bargain for an EV that costs the best part of £50,000 new. Uh, and what we've got is a, a 23 Reg. Uh, it's seven months old, I had 10,500 miles on the clock when I picked it up and it, it's in pretty good condition, it's got a couple of sort of typical rental car battle scars here and there but all in all you're getting a, you know, a pretty new, pretty clean, decent car for next to nothing and I don't know how Hertz are making any money, uh, it was much much cheaper than uh, an equivalent petrol or diesel car would have been to rent from Hertz but I'm very very happy with that and actually it makes me think if I was doing like long journeys in the future I maybe would rent one of these to do it and again, or at least depending on how the journey goes, that will probably decide whether I'd want to rent one again in the future. I stayed in the Sea View Hotel, which, although basic and a little bit dated, provided clean, comfortable enough accommodation. Uh, we had dinner in the uh, hotel bar the night before, and that it was pretty decent, all the told. Uh, decent value for money, decent portion sizes, and you can't really go wrong. Breakfast the next morning was absolutely the highlight, a proper full Scottish breakfast, although I would have liked to see some square sausage. And the only thing left to do before we leave was to plan the journey. Now, a lot of people talk about planning EV journeys and they get a little bit hit up about this. Oh, I don't want to spend ages planning my journey. Well, let me show you what planning looks like. You download an app called A Better Route Planner, ABRP. You open that app, you specify which car you have, in this case, a uh, Polestar 2 long range single motor. You tell it where you're starting from. Obviously, if you're actually doing this while you're there, you it'll know where you're starting from. You can start from my position, but in this case, we put in, we're starting from John O'Groats. We're going to Penrith in this case, because that's where the first overnight stop is going to be. And in the settings, I tell it I want to see stops of more than four charging points. Now, you might actually want to look for more than that, I would actually recommend maybe looking for 6 or 8 or 12, depending on where you're going. But we'll start with 4 and we'll see what the route looks like. And then it shows that it wants us to stop at Tesla in Aviemore and then Fastned Palace Grounds in Hamilton. That looks like a fair enough route to me, so let's get cracking. And how long did that take? Well, not half an hour. 
As I said, the weather was really bad in John O'Groats, so I didn't do any filming before we left. It was blowing a gale, the wind was terrible, the rain was terrible. It, it just wasn't going to be conducive to making decent footage, so we got straight on the road. first charging stop at Tesla and Aviemore was bearing down on us. It was a little bit of an odd one this, the charging station was at the M McDonald Resort Hotel in Aviemore, which is a, it's multiple hotels as the name suggests, it's a massive resort, you, you drive into this like, it's like a village in itself and it's all part of the same hotel group, and we eventually navigated round to where the Tesla superchargers were. Four chargers here, thankfully one of them was available, so we got plugged in and got charging. So you join me now at the first charging stop, which is at the Tesla Supercharger site in Aviemore. I was planning on doing a bit more filming in John O'Groats, but as you will have seen from some of the, the pictures and stuff that I showed at the start of the video, the weather was absolutely crazy. It was really, really windy and rainy when we got there last night, and that was definitely continuing this morning. So it wasn't really conducive to making decent footage. So we're now 3 hours and 23 minutes into the journey and I'm charging here at Tesla in Aviemore. Uh, there are four superchargers here and uh, are currently charging at 75 kilowatts, which isn't ideal, but all four are in use. So I'm guessing the power is shared and maybe the, the incoming supply isn't massive. Uh, it's certainly a little bit down on um, the 150 kilowatts I was seeing at, at Tesla in Inverness when I was charging yesterday on the way up to John O'Groats. But uh, it's fast enough. Um, we'll need to top up to about 65% sort of ish according to a better route planner um, So I shouldn't be here for too long and I will bring you back as that charging session comes to an end So that's us been charging for about 30 minutes. We're at 75% and it's definitely time to move on It took me most of that time to find where the toilets were in the hotel to be honest with you The place is like a maze and there's not a huge amount of signage So I'm just kind of wandering around the corridors of the hotel waiting to get told off for being somewhere I shouldn't there's been a slight change in plan, so the, the, the plan as we showed on a better route planner this morning was to the next stop to be at Fastened in Hamilton, um, which would be absolutely fine, we'll get there no problem and, and that would be a, a strategic place to stop to get to Penrith. But we decided there's a restaurant we really like in Stirling, so I'm going to stop there, we're going to have some lunch. Uh, there are some charges there, but they're 50 kilowatt rapids, it'll be a little bit slow. Uh, but in the time it takes us to actually have some lunch, it, we should still get a meaningful amount of charge into the car. And then we'll just need to double check just where we stand in terms of range to get to Penrith. But I think all in all, we're on track, slight deviation but at the end of the day, not only do I want to show you that uh, travel long distance like this in an EV is easy and it's nowhere near as hard as some people might make it out to be, I also want to show that you don't need to have this military style plan that you need to stick to and you need to, oh we definitely need to charge here and we definitely need to charge there. If things change, you just change it up a little bit and you still get to where you're going. And it doesn't need to be this fixed thing. I think a lot of people fixate on, oh well, I don't want to uh, charge where I have to, I want to charge where I want to, I want to stop where I want to and so I think this goes a long way to show that that is also possible.
as we headed away from Avi Moore on the A9, everything seemed to be going well until we encountered some pretty bad traffic. There was some roadworks, which meant we were backed up for quite some way in a stop-start traffic for quite a while. This was a 30, 40 minute delay to the journey. I hadn't planned for, wasn't aware of until the Google Maps in the car started telling me there was going to be a delay and I think it shows that you are at the mercy of the traffic when you're doing long journeys like this. Not to mind though, not <clears throat> after we got moving again though it wasn't too bad and we were soon heading towards Stirling. Charging at Stirling was pretty straightforward using the Charge Place Scotland network. I've got an RFID card for Charge Place Scotland, although you can use their app if you don't have one. Uh, these rapid chargers were quite cheap, priced at 40 pence per kilowatt hour. Definitely the cheapest network I used for the entire time for the entire trip. We'll talk about costs in more detail later, but. One thing that's a little bit of a pain with Charge Place Scotland is every council has their own rules about charging and how long you can charge for and how much they charge. So you need to make sure you check and understand in the app what you're dealing with. In Stirling, there's a 40 minute maximum stave on a rapid charger, which is a little bit of a pain, but I cheated a little bit and just moved it to the next one along after the first 40 minutes because we were still, it took us a little while to get served in the restaurant we were in. So I just moved it along and kept it charging. Uh, the 40 minutes would probably have been enough as it turned out but there was no harm in topping off a little bit more. And as we left Stirling that's where it all started to go a little bit wrong. Straight away the sat nav was suggesting that I avoid the motorway and take a sort of odd back route heading towards Denny and stuff then rejoining the, the motorway a bit further up to avoid traffic and it was already giving me a bit of a bad feeling I, I think when you see the traffic is getting worse and worse now it was heading on for the sort of rush hour between Stirling and Glasgow so I was expecting a little bit of traffic but and in fairness the M80 once I was finally on it wasn't really much different to usual it was busy but it was flowing wasn't too bad but it was then when I got towards the M74 that things started to take a bit of a turn for the worst. There had been a crash which meant that the northbound carriageway was closed and of course everybody on the southbound carriageway which is where I was heading for was rubbernecking which was also bringing that to a standstill. I ended up coming off heading towards Hamilton and coming back on actually where the Fastned charging site would have been if I had stopped there instead of at Stirling and we were on our way again but there was a hefty delay and it took quite a while to rejoin the M74 which was moving but moving very slowly. By the time we got back on the M74 they were starting to move cars off of the northbound it was starting to open up again. Hopefully anybody that was involved in the crash there is okay it seems like it was quite a nasty one. There was no sign of any need to charge or anything like that. I definitely added enough range at Stirling that we were going to make it to the hotel, no problem. But the delays and having to come off the motorway and come back on were certainly not adding to how pleasant the journey was. Once we arrived at the hotel in Penrith, it was time to charge. There were six Eon Drive destination chargers here. So that brings us to the end of the first day. I have just arrived at my hotel in Penrith, 391 miles from John O'Groats. That has been quite the day that has. Uh, it was 10 hours in, in total from start to finish, but you'd be surprised to hear, I think, that absolutely none of the reason for the delay was the fact that I'm in an electric car. There was a massive hold-ups on the A9 due to the roadworks there, and that, that meant it took us far longer to get between Aviemore and Stirling than I'd planned. Um, and so we were later leaving Stirling than we planned, and then there was a crash on the M74, which meant there was a massive, massive tailbacks there. The northbound carriageway was closed. And then, as always happens, the southbound carriageway was then jammed up because everybody's looking over to see what's going on. And that meant it was just an absolute nightmare. We had to come off the motorway and then come back on. And actually, as it turns out, I think the change to my plan where we decided to go for lunch uh, and then 
charged in Stirling rather than charging in Hamilton was actually quite a good thing because the way I ended up going to get back on the M74 I actually passed the Fastned site in Hamilton which is where I would have charged and I think with all the problems on the motorway we probably would have found that we'd have got there about the kind of time that we'd have meant we'd be sitting there charging watching the traffic situation develop around us and watch the access to the M74 get busier and busier and busier which obviously would have added to the sort of stress at the time whereas in fact I didn't even need to think about the state of charge of the battery at all. We had more than enough charge upon leaving Stirling, which meant that charging wasn't, wasn't just wasn't on the agenda at all. Traffic was the problem, and traffic had been the problem throughout the day. All in all, everything was successful. At Aviemore, uh, there are four Tesla superchargers there. And when I pulled up there, there were three cars charging, and there was one bay available, so I could plug in and I could charge, and it was no problem. Uh, it was a little bit slower than we expected at 75 kilowatts because the way they were sharing power between the units, but it was fine. And then in Stirling, there was loads of rapids there. They were all available. They are only 50 kilowatt, but that was more than enough to get us going. Uh, one problem there was actually in Stirling is um, Stirling Council apply a maximum stay on their rapids of 40 minutes and after 40 minutes they charge you a pound per minute overstay charge now people like overstay charges because it means people don't hog chargers but if you've got a big battery car like this which would still be charging beyond those 40 minutes quite easily especially at 50 kilowatts and the situation we were in where the service in the restaurant we ended up in was a little bit slow and so we were still eating and the sort of 40 minutes was coming up so i had to go out and uh, I actually just unplugged the car, moved it to the next charger along and plugged it back in and started another session. Or what I could have done, because it was, it was charged enough, really, I could have just unplugged it, parked it up. Not ideal, and I think Stirling Council probably want to, to think about that a little bit. I think a 40 minute session time on ultra rapids is fair enough, because the vast majority of cars on a 150 kilowatt, 350 kilowatt ultra rapid are going to charge quickly enough that 40 minutes is more than enough. But on these old 50 kilowatt units, yeah, I'm not so sure. I mean, 40 minutes is probably cutting it a little bit fine on cars with a smaller battery than this, you know. Even stuff like the Zoe it charges quite slowly. I don't know if 40 minutes is quite enough. You move just a little bit more, you know, 45 would probably be more like it. And having to pay overstay charges, yeah, I don't know. That's probably one for another video, actually, because Charge Place Scotland actually is a little bit crazy with its uh, different tariffs in different areas. So I think we'll need to talk about that in more detail. Tomorrow and in the next video, we will be going from here in Penrith to Land's End. That's a slightly longer day. I'm hopeful that it's actually going to be quite similar in time. I'm hopeful we're traffic wise, fingers crossed, although it is going to be a Saturday. Dra driving the length of England on a Saturday, not sure how good an idea that is. Driving the length of Scotland on a Friday turned out not to be the best idea. Uh, so traffic wise, fingers crossed, but join me in the next video for part two of this series where you see me drive from Penrith to Land's End, the length of England, almost, okay, we're, we're, we're slightly past the border, on a Saturday in an electric car. How successful will I be? Will I end up frustrated, waiting for chargers, finding broken chargers, all that stuff? Well, certainly this part of the trip so far, where we've driven the length of Scotland, I've not had any of those problems whatsoever and actually I think as predicted it's been much more successful than I think a lot of people might think. There's been no problems at all so far with charging, availability's been good, uh, reliability's been good. I'll tell you the only ish, slight issue we've had. So thankfully there are destination chargers at this hotel. There are six Eon Drive AC chargers here which we're plugged into which means we'll be fully charged in the morning and that has presented the first even slight inkling of issues with charging on this entire trip. The chargers work absolutely fine, but you need the Eon Drive app to start them, so you need to download the app, you need to create an account. All this stuff that people really hate that the new public charging legislation should do away with, when chargers like even like this should need to be contactless payment. These are 11 kilowatt AC chargers, so they should be contactless payment going forward. And that means that you don't need to sign up for an app and hope the app's working and then get the app to start the charge, all that crap. You would just scan your card and it would work. And I must say that would be a massive improvement on 
what it was here so I had to faff about with the app and then try to start the charge and it didn't start and I had to do it again and again the two or three attempts and eventually it started finding it is charging and everything's fine and the car will be fully charged in the morning and that makes a huge difference if you can start the day with 100% charge it makes a massive difference but it shouldn't have been as hard as it was to get that charge started so I do think that if you, if you want to pick at anything the only slight inkling of problems with charging i've had has been with these destination chargers at the hotel which is crazy really and i think what we're going to see in part two of this video is that destination charging is really really important so the fact i'm going to start the day tomorrow with 100 percent because i've managed to charge at the hotel is going to make a huge difference so do make sure you look out for part two of the video where i drive from penrith to land's end and hopefully it will be as successful as this first part was. And fingers crossed, if there's a little bit less traffic, it might even be more successful. Thank you so much for watching this video. I do hope you've enjoyed it. And I do hope you see the, the true reality of long distance EV travel in the UK, where actually often the traffic and the reality of driving in the UK is the bad bit. And that, the EV bit isn't that bad at all. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time. I see by now that quite a few of you have watched that video where I set out that I was going to be doing this challenge and sort of called out some of the things that were done by the pair that did the, the challenge a couple of weeks ago. Of course, some of you disagree with me. Some of you think that because I've got a different opinion to them that I'm wrong. Okay, cool. Uh, some of you think that two other guys that make YouTube videos are definitely right about something that, and if I do it, that's not valid. Don't really get it, but whatever. I, I, I'm i not really bothered about some of that stuff. You know, I, I told you that I'd show you the truth about my experience driving an EV long distance in the UK, and that's exactly what we're doing. So uh, I, I hope that this video has got that across to you, that actually it isn't as hard as has been presented. And for me, it was actually pretty straightforward today. I had a few comments saying, well, why didn't you use your own car? So it's like, well, the Zoe is a small hatchback, it's not particularly comfortable, nor is it designed to be. And for like 20 quid a day, I could drive a proper size car with a bigger battery, with more performance, with, the you know, it's quieter, it's just much more suited to the task. I'm sure there's a reason why Jeff didn't buy a little diesel Volkswagen Polo to do the John O'Groats to Land's End trip and instead bought a BMW 3 Series. Just like, I'm sure there's a reason anybody doing regular sort of long distance motorway driving isn't doing it in a super mini. So I, I don't really get, oh yeah, you could just use your own car. Well, I could, and maybe I should, but when I could rent this from Hertz for so cheap and actually get the chance to spend quite a bit of time with the Polestar 2 and see if it's worth all the hype. I really like this when I drove it at Grid Servant, which is obviously a fairly quick test drive, for sort of half an hour, you know, sort of round the sh sort of streets of Braintree, round about where the electric four core is. Is that enough to let you know whether a car is actually for you or not? Well, what will definitely let you know is 1600 miles in it in four days. I think that'd be a really, really good way to tell if you're gonna like it or not. So actually the opportunity to do that, when I was doing this trip anyway, and then I could rent this cheaply from Hertz to do so, it's a bit of a no-brainer if you ask me. Um, I think I'll be able to form a much better opinion of the, the sort of strengths and weaknesses of the Polestar 2 based on doing this journey. And that alone makes it worth it for me. And actually already, now that we're about a thousand miles in, I've spent about a thousand miles sat in this seat. Uh, and that's obviously the distance to John O'Groats and then back down to here. It, there's already stuff about this that I like and I don't like that I wasn't aware of after the short test drive. So for me, Renting this and doing it in this is absolutely worth it. And so far, what I'd say is sort of as an EV and the capability of this car in terms of sort of long distance, not having really to worry too much about charging and the charging speed being reliable and stuff, it really does tick a lot of those boxes. This long range single motor Polestar 2 really is a nice bit of gear and I am enjoying it. There are some things I'm not so keen on, but I'm going to do a bit of a review video at the end that focuses on the Polestar 2. These videos are about the journey and the practicalities of long distance in an EV. We'll do another 
what was it actually like to drive the Polestar for 1600 miles and we'll, we'll dive deeper into that because I think there's quite a bit of interest in these I've seen a few people on Twitter saying they either they're thinking about one or they've been offered it as a company car or a few people have said they've got one they love it so yeah I think we, we could do some deep dive on the Polestar too uh, but for now uh, I definitely think it's a decent tool for the job and I I'm so glad I'm not doing it in the Zoe and that's not just because it charges slower or it's got a smaller battery it's because the comfort wise it, it just doesn't compare and nor should it let's be honest